Our first speaker is Professora Oza Maria Perish, who is an anthropologist and senior researcher at the Center of Research in Anthropology, Korea. Until August 2020, she was a professor of the Department of Anthropology of ISCTE University Institute of Lisbon. She has been a visiting professor at different universities in the US, notably Brown University, so also Europe, Mozambique, Brazil, and India. Since 2012, she has been a visiting professor at IIGN India. Her core research is on Indian society and social segregation, women's studies, colonialism, and post-colonialism in India, fieldwork methodology, public anthropology, and human rights. Rosora Parish is a consultant of the UN Commission for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment and the European Councils on Asia. Her latest book in English is Transdisciplinary Ethnography in India, Women in the Field, co-edited by Lena M. Trusepi. In June 2020, she received a Medal of Scientific Merit from the Portuguese Minister of Science and Technology and Higher Education. I now request our first distinguished speaker, Professor Oza Maria Perish, to address the gathering on the theme Anthropology in New Terrains, Editing Colonial Contradictions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation. I will try to fit into the 20 minutes uh, ascribed to me. Uh, and out of organization, I wrote my paper, which I will start reading. I would just like to make a little correction. Uh, I will not deal with Free Goa, but with Goa Tribuna. My apologies for that. So um, the title of my paper is Anthropology in New Terrains, Editing Colonial Contradictions. So ethnography has long been the method and canon of anthropology as a discipline. Under the seminal influence of Bernard Cohn, with his now classic, an anthropologist among historians and other essays, published in 1987, anthropologists venture to navigate the archives in a way decanonizing the dominant models of observation. I have written and spoken a lot about the relevance of what Nicholas Dirk's term, ethnography of the archive, and mostly, I would say, of the non-canonical archive where you can unveil forms of elaboration that are not evident, such as the creation of different classifications and racial categories. The non-canonical archive fed by different kinds of texts that were devaluated by quote unquote traditional archivists also alert us to the persistence of initial forms of categorization that resisted new paradigms of knowledge and that constitute powerful hierarchies of power. The ethnographic analysis of the archive motivated scholars who moved from classical sources to narratives, autobiographies, and ethnographies. This is particularly true if these files are read ethnographically, interpreted as authentic cultural artifacts with systems of logic and representation, an attempt that Antoinette Burton achieved successfully. In doing so, the author intended to dissolve dichotomies that tend to crystallize that data in opposing and discontinuous structures, the most important being the dichotomy between discourse and reality that should instead being considered as mutually constitute, constitutive of knowledge. Scholars, like some historians and anthropologists, has highlighted a persistent occurrence in the archives. The suppression, adulteration, control of groups such as women, madmen, dissidents, marginals. It is my assumption that the critical analysis of the Goan colonial press may lead us to framing research and analysis topics from the perspectives of peripheral and marginalized actors. Well, while much is written about doing fieldwork in the archive, 
minor intellectual energy is devoted to reflecting on the possibility and relevance of an ethnography in the press and its implications for creating anthropological, literary, and historical knowledge. In a seminal book under the title The Anthropology of Texts, Persons, and Public, published in 2007, Canyon Barber, even though admitting that, and I'm quoting, texts are social facts, texts are used to do things, they are forms of action, and of quotation, even though she does not address the importance of the press as a social fact. Elizabeth Bird, excuse me, is one of the few anthropologists who embarked on the unexplored terrain of press and ethnography. In her pioneer edited volume, these fields, anthropology and press, are finally forced to look at one another intimately, to engage with and debate methodologies, representational practices and their implications, and professional mandates and ethics. For grounding the relative neglect of journalism, news and images, in otherwise holistic anthropological projects, she argues for a desirable mutual, mutual appreciation that can lead to a more serious consideration of the ways in which new texts shape the very daily realities and large institutional context, context that ethnographers seek to document and analyze. For Bird, like ethnography, the press creates narratives about reality. I believe that for anthropologists immersed in the notion of ethnographies as narrative constructions, this should be an obvious, obvious point. And yet, often, we don't act as it is. I also believe that the time has come for us, anthropologists, to engage with the press, with its creation, reception, and content. Also, such engagement may take, of course, different forms. Because news, new, the news are the tools from which we can gather the construction of opinions within a, within a specific political and social landscape, we anthropologists should abandon our discipline's traditional reluctance to engage with the narratives that increasingly have come to shape the world, and we should try to reconstruct a multi tier reality in order to develop a, a holistic approach to social systems. Anthropologists on their side can offer the press innovative insights in the conceptual, in conceptual, ethical, and social dimensions. There are, however, conditions that we must observe. The hegemony, both in anthropological studies and in the press, of Euro-American paradigms must, must be subverted. In other words, the ethnographic analysis of the press in Goa must constitute a contribution to reject and inevitably criticize the epistemology of the West. In Mignolo's words, it is about, and I'm quoting him, an epistemic disobedience that would, uh, should, would dissenter and disrupt the traditional geopolitics of knowledge. Some scholars of the press can inspire us in this endeavor. Jennifer Asti's outstanding, outstanding chapter called Journalism as Fieldwork transport us out of the familiar comfort zone of journalism as practiced in the United States and in Europe. Karen Wall uh, Jorgensen outlines the limits of research approach that have privileged the seemingly sacred space of mainstream newsrooms in Western contexts. Thus, marginalizing journalism, different avatars in non-Western settings. I'd say, I would re remind you that long before Ranajit Guha had, had insisted on a necessary transgression, transgression of the intention and rules of decorum that regulate 
scholarly activity by displacing the casual and descriptive assumptions about South Asian colonial history embedded in dominance, dominant models and research strategies. In my presentation today, I will explore the potential of an ethnographic weaving of the press grounded on an anthropological research on nationalist women in Goa. As we know, and as I have mentioned in another context, the narrative about the nationalist movement in Goa was written predominantly in male terms. The presence of women in this movement is residual and only recently have some Goan newspaper and websites started referring to nationalist women. During a long-term anthropological research that I carried out in a Hindu temple of Ponda, uh, from which result in the book, The Tusi and the Cross, Anthropology and the Colonial Encounter in Goa, I met an exceptional, solitary woman who had been a Devadasi dancer a ritual dancer of the same temple. During one of our meetings at her house around a cup of tea, she mentioned her participation and the participation of other women in the movement for a free Goa. And like some of them, she was not sent to jail due to her lifelong liaison with a prominent Brahmin. My presentation is part of my research with, as I said, women nationalists in Goa. I will focus on the life story of one of these women. My very good and friend, Fatima Grissi, just sent me a book that she launched yesterday. Uh, one of these women and their tra traumatic imprisonment, first in Panjim and then in Margal. Other women, uh, and their name is Sarvar Sadekar. Uh, Our women's narratives replicate a dramatic struggle. However, because the complexity of the process and the project was missing from many accounts, I tried to fill what I would call, maybe a little bit uh, too pretentiously, a narrative fissure by locating myself at two kinds of texts. The, tri the trials by the Tribunal Militar Territorial, Military Territorial Court, which I will not, will not present today, and the press, more precisely to journals that constitute to me a mirror of each other. Diario de Noite, a daily newspaper supported by the colonial regime and Go on Tribune, edited, as we all know, by Lombert Mascarenhas, which was a periodical published by Goa based in Bombay, now Mumbai that command the movement seeking Goa's liberation. My attention will be, be driven to the late period of Portuguese colonial, colonialism in India, especially when the escalating liberation movement triggered harsh colonial oppression. Here also, the image of a mirror comes to my mind. The non-violent, or Aimsha, Gandhian movement of Satyagraha or Satyagrahis to liberate Goa from the colonial regime clashed against the political power that resorted to arms in a desperate attempt to keep Goa as a Portuguese province, a term by Salazar to mitigate the opposition of the UN and Britain to his colonial politics. For lack of time, I will refer dominantly to the critical year of 1955. The tension mounted when demonstrators gather at Belgaon to celebrate Independence Day and march into the colony to demand the end, an end to the Portuguese rule. The party news reported that when they reached the, the border, the Portuguese police opened fire. Over 20 died and many were injured. A visit to the archive of Pate News, which is now online, known today as British Pate, evidences the dimension of prote the protest against Portuguese rule. The very same year, 10,000 10, demonstrators in New Delhi uh, gathered around Parliament House, shouting against Portuguese presence in Goa and claiming that Goa was part of India. Let me now introduce you to a Goan nationalist who will constitute the cluster 
as my attempt today to expand ethnographic research, theoretical and methodological horizons on these two colonial newspapers, excuse me, and their representation of conflicting perspectives and movements, as, and movements. Her name, as I already mentioned, is Sharada Savarkar, and she was 16 years old when she was arrested at her home in a village in Kanakuna. A tell of reference for the nationalist movement, particularly concerning a constellation of women who played a crucial role in this movement. With other women, she was incarcerated in Panjim, where, in the absence of a prison for women, they shared a small room that, that forced them to spend long periods on their feet. Police surveillance was tied, and interrogations were instruments of torture at the ends of Casimiro Monteiro. Unfortunately, we all, all have heard about him after as we know, after um, torturing and uh, sending to jail many uh, um, leaders of the nationalist movement, he came to Portugal to join the PID and to kill Humberto Delgado. A vivid memory, er, I mean, um, Sar Char Charada, a vivid memory of prison and torture is extremely disturbing, and it was often excruciating to me to listen to her, both for being a woman and Portuguese, and of course for, for having uh, lived under the Salazar regime when I was younger. I will forsake for now a question that I will deal with in a book that I'm currently writing, the power and the role of memory, especially of traumatic memories, which should lead me to different fields namely neurosciences, but let us keep it for the moment. Despite describing in detail the itinerary, itinerary from her capture to prison, despite the minutiae with which she portrayed the tools used by Monteiro for her torture and the marks left on her young body, the most despicable going in her words, referring to Casimir Monteiro, there was always a void in our long conversations. The reasons for being the only woman in Panjim, in the prison of Panjim, to suffer regular and cruel tortures. She endorsed the reason of the arrest to the possible murder of a policeman by a male member of her biological family. Still, she never offered any details about this incident. On the contrary, she would avoid it, as did other women who are still alive or their families. Going back and forth in the trials by the military court, which I had the opportunity to present in Goa, uh, I was never able to find a trial, although she described it in detail. Nor was her name mentioned in the many trials of women and men that I examined. Diário de Noite gave, gave least spa, space, albeit frequent, to attacks on Portuguese sovereignty by terrorists. These terrorists, uh, the name given to the Portuguese, to the Satyagrahis, had no age or gender, no social status or place of origin. There were no visual representations, not or even a glimpse on their faces their bodies, their dress code. In other words, if, if, even if I don't want to uh, like to use the term, they didn't have an identity. They constitute uh, instead an obscure and distinguishable amalgam, which more than people represented India and consequently an ominous threat to colonial rule. This erasure of the body this identitary, identitary invisibility is re reproduced largely, dominantly, by the, uh, the, the trials of the territorial military court formatted and formalized to remove individuality from the aggressors of the colonial reg regime. Residually, one or another handwritten letter, such as one by Maria Joaquina Calis toward 
passado 10 pandemias de líder, de, de, de main leader of the, the women's movement in, in Goa, the, these handwritten letters are sometimes the, the backbone of these people whose voices, however, are silenced by the court's indifference to their requests. On the contrary, Goa Tribune offered on a regular basis the news of the clashes between, between the colonial police and the Goa nationalists. Also reference to women are scarce, an interesting fact that I will not be able to analyze today. These nationalists, even though their photographs are occasional, have a voice that we can hear, a voice that claims for freedom and justice, that they have a project that they are ready to give their lives for. They have bodies, often dressed in white cotton, khaki, the hand spun and then woven fabric that Gandhi embraced as one of the symbols of Indian independence. A trajectory through this and other per periodicals printed in exile allow us to identif identify not only the nationalist project, but also, and I'd like to underscore this, but also the social relations and the so social system that structured it. This narrative fissure, as I called it, and that I mentioned before, is little by little fulfilled in a comprehensive configuration that is the more important that the dominant narratives written about colonial Goa have adopted, uh, and then uh, what I had coined in a, ten, in a text printed in 1994, a lusocentric perspective. One evening, going through Goa Tribune, I found the reason for the silence. I found even the reason for the silence, if, even if I was not looking for it, of Savarkar about her imprisonment, imprisonment and torture. Her father had killed the Portuguese policeman who had shot incrementally uh, several statiares. Anthropology and press. Walt Ayrton, in the text, What Journalism Can Offer Ethnography, wrote that, and allow me to quote, it, to quote him. Journalists are the junkyard dogs of ethnography. We are not trained formal research methods or theories. We've got no idea of the differences between the Chicago School and British social anthropology. No idea what you're talking about when you debate postmodernism, postpostmodernism, poststructuralism, or postcritical ethnography. But as the saying goes, we've learned a thing or two along the way. In college, and he was by training an anthropologist. We never read another classic work of academic ethnography. Instead, we adopted the spirit of the approach, taking to art the goal of capturing, as documentary historian William Stott calls it, and I'm quoting, feel the feeling of a living experience. End of quotation by Scott, by Stott. We learn to live by Novelis Tamitan's advice that the wise person must learn to lose your innocence, but not your own. We also learn this, uh, the complicated worlds we never are next to impossible, we, we enter are next to impossible to recreate in words. It is humbling and is elevating to realize this. It sets off a lifelong journey to figure out how to turn those, those thousands of pieces of lies and shards of perception into stories that are true to the documentary facts. The question is, he asks, why should you as anthropologists care? End of quotation. Should we as anthropologists care? Of course, we should care, especially when the press permits us to identify the silent, oppressive voices of the past, and to borrow Robert Schwartz's expression, allow us to rescue ideas of the past. I think I'm within my time, am I? Yes, uh, yes, uh, yes uh, you're, you're finished on time. Yes, thank you so much.
I cut my present. Well, I, as I, I, I told in the beginning, I, I prepared a PowerPoint, but I don't think that okay. I will have time to present it. We apologize in giving lesser time than uh, initially decided for you. Yeah, I knew, uh, yeah, I knew t this morning and I stopped cutting my paper. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Oza Maria Parish, for your brilliant presentation. We now have our second speaker, Dr. Sandra Atayid Lobu, who is a renowned scholar on colonial Goa. Her PhD is on history and theory of ideas. It is titled Would Bejas Say Goes the Political System in Goa? The Liberalism of Act Colonial, presented in 2013. I personally feel that this work is a must read for scholars researching on the history of colonial Goa. Dr. Lobo is a researcher of Fakunda de Ciencia Sociais e Humanes at Sham, Center of Humanities at Universidad Nova de Lisboa. Additionally, Dr. Sandra is also the co-founder of International Group for Studies of Colonial Periodical Press of the Portuguese Empire. I request Dr. Sandra to address on the theme of public opinion and public sphere an approach to Goa in press and burn press in the 19th century. Thank you very much, Shermila. Um, I will start my presentation. Um, I would uh, wish, I'd like to wish you all of you a very good evening. And I, I want to uh, give my sincere thanks to Dr. Sh uh, Sushila Mendes, Sharmila Pais, and Frederick Moronha for organizing this event. In the present talk, I will share some reflections around the ideas of public opinion and public sphere, where until uh, uh, late, the, ro uh, the role of periodical press was prevalent. When, uh, when approaching in a colonial and imperial environment, defending, as other scholars have been concluding, that approaching such ambiences invite to rethink them in pluralized terms, offering historical support to the present discussions around such concepts. It is a reflection that I have been maturing since my PhD, raised by the doubts that the Goan uh, case created to me. And, that precise, and precisely because of that, here I raise more a series of inter interrogations for research than definitive responses. In fact, I'm still maturing such reflections. And along the years, I have benefited immensely from the discussions fueled by the International Group for Studies of Colonial Press of the Portuguese Empire, namely for its emphasis on the colonial and the imperial realms. Lately, such discussions have extended to the edition of the books soon to be released that followed its first international congress in 2017. I emphasize such process because to a significant extent, my standing point reflects this collective to which all colleagues present at this event contributed to. As all of you know, while the modern idea of public opinion has a centenary history, that of public sphere is much more recent, being coined in 1962 by Jürgen Habermas. Generically speaking, historically, the idea of public opinion, opinion although correlated, has always been much more broader and open than the perspective adopted by Habermas. In fact, Habermas was particularly interested in a normative 
political theory of democracy, as pointed by Nancy Fraser and recently underlined by Emma Hunter and Leslie James, in his delimitation of the social space conceived by post-enlightenment uh, post bourgeoisie, where the mechanism in liberal and dem democratic society operate to achieve political public consensus through reasonable argumentation on matters of governance, thus indirectly participating in decision making. Habermas' ob object is the nation state as idealized in Western countries without considering, amongst other issues, how historically the colonial and imperial dimension, dimension of many of such countries complex, uh, a complex, uh, complicated such idealization. Brief differently, although strongly attached since the turn of the uh, to the 19th century by the idealization of liberal nation states the idea of public opinion was never solely restricted to the to national public opinion on the contrary as the modern history of the uh, of the idea for international relations and the own idea of, of liberal governance evidence, not speak of other political currents, it always counted also with the fluid imaginary of international and transnational communities or publics, which opinions should condition the trends of national societies in different realms the relations between them and even the way the evolution of humanity should be conceived. On the other hand, it needs to be emphasized in any instance of consideration, namely that at a national level, that as underlined by Neil Audrey Bhattachari and Vinanare Gell, when analyzing the Indian situation under the British Raj, even through reasonable argument, consensus is not necessarily achieved. In fact, we may argue that as uh, liberals, liberals soon became aware of, by di diversifying uh, political representation, democracy is nour nourished by the tension of the idea of, uh, of consensus achieved by prevailing public and, uh, opinion and of dissent by mi minority or underrepresented community, uh, communities of whatever nature, nature. Growing attention was paid and is being paid to the voiceless and to the communities that while expressing their anxieties in public, are dis disregarded by the demonic forces that act as representatives of the public opinion, dominating the production of discourses in the public sphere. The consciousness, consciousness of such uh, diversity appeals to the use of the concept in the plural, conditioning the consideration, the consideration of players and the game of forces to permanent revision, even within communities. As for instance, Jason Kidd Fernandez called up attention to in his PhD recently published. That is, the idea of public opinion and of its role in public life has developed and continues to develop at the rhythm of a growing awareness of the complexity of the complex set of issues, namely, namely social and, ideolo and ideological, that conditions its existence. And once again, I underline that appeals to pluralize its consideration. 
this discussion is naturally at the core of the, uh, of the recent discussions on the concept of uh, public sphere. As it defies in different modes the consideration of the, the public sphere as solely national and of its reduction to the terms idealized by Habermas. This does not necessarily mean that the concept of public sphere is not operational to approach the idea of public opinion in its plurality, but means that it carries concomitant pluralization of the concept of uh, public sphere, one that counts both with the existence of plural public spheres and that is aware that individuals and communities frequently move between such spheres and play with them. Having as already pointed, uh, periodic press, press played a prevalent, a prevalent role in the formation and expression of public opinions and in the constitution of public spheres and in the di dialogue established uh, between them. From a historic uh, point of view, press studies become a major source of reflection while its study uh, uh, its studies uh, requires a, a awareness to such complexity. This me brings me back to the perplexities that the study of press in the colonial and imperial context may raise. Uh, uh, as I have uh, understood since I began in 2005 to analyze Go and Press. As I have underlined, uh, underlined since then, I believe that the history of Go and Press, fundamental to study Go and intellectual history, may not be serial, seriously approached without taking into consideration the ambiguous situation of Goa, Goa being both a colony suffering the subaltern position of such situation, and at the same time being since the since the liberal revolution considered a province of Portugal at least until uh, uh, the 1930s, and back again in the 1950s. Uh, a province of, of the Portuguese nation state. Its Catholic inhabitants being since the liberal revolution considered Portuguese citizens, a status that was enlarged uh, since uh, the constitutional charter of, of 1826 to the other religious communities. At the same time, this did not stop the, uh, the look at uh, the, uh, the citizens of, of the, the colonies as uh, subaltern uh, system, uh, uh, citizens in regards to uh, the, uh, the Portuguese mainstream. This is a situation that brings us to the complex human also to the complex human characteristics of the uh, the Goan territory, marked by religious diversity, caste, race, race that dictated profound social tensions, with expression also in language plurality which have direct expression in press initiatives and its contents. We have also to take into consideration when, uh, when thinking about these matters, the role played by Goans in the management of the Portuguese empire and the role of its Catholic intellectual elite, both uh, in such management and in the growing focuses of resistance to Portuguese rule. 
Not least, we have to consider the intervention of many intellectuals in Portuguese press in the metropole and how such intervention may be interpreted. At the same time, as Rochelle Pinto has emphasized along her work, we may not ignore the imbricated position of a go going tradition of being between empires with a growing dependence on British India and its empire, where growing population from all sectors uh, uh, migrating, uh, uh, migrating along uh, a time, uh, especially uh, since the 19th century. We have also to take into consideration that since 1961, Goa integrated the Indian nation state. So its history is also a part of the history, history of India. Additional, even before that, many Goan intellectuals fought, fought both for Indian independence from, from British and from Portuguese rule. So any attempt to separate such histories becomes simplistic. Finally, how can we interpret the way the Portuguese state itself and its local representatives interfer interfered in the condition of the press history in Goa? And how we may, may we read the press launch by initiative or support of the Portuguese power? Or how can we read the role of the Portuguese journalists in, in Goa and how they interfere in local press dynamics. In resume, how can we, in such contexts, in, interpret the history of Goan press as part of Portuguese history, a uh, 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 press history with a local perspective? As a colonial press subjected to different logics of consideration of nation and its narrative, as Indian press formerly under Portuguese rule, more important, how did this complex situation interfere in the history of Goan press and with Goan intervention, intervention in press in different spaces? How did this, this complex uh, situation interfered in the perceptions and dialogues established by Goan intellectuals and journalists in the different political and cultural cu currents than that transnationally marked wave of the debate. Not, not the least, how did these intellectuals play with the different publics and public spheres with which which these questions could convoke, namely the community, the community, the caste, the class, the colonial, the national, the, the imperial, the international, and, and the transnational. The analyze of colonial press evidence why the idea of the public sphere needs to be enriched and pluralized as a contribution to the history of democracy by the consideration of the social, local, national, imperial, and international public spheres, offering historical support to the this, this discussions around the continent. I believe that considering all these enhanced levels, that since the very beginning marked the history of Goan press, may be used as an important uh, study case to the theorization of such discussions and to the conceptualization of both idea of public opinion and public sphere in colonial and imperial context. I briefly finish with the example of the weekly Gazeta de Goa that we are commemorating in the bicentenary of press in Goa, signaling the 22 of December 1821 as the day, date when the first periodical was launched 
in the territory. This uh, launching happened just three months after, uh, since a, revolu a revolutionary uh, uh, movement forced the deposition of the then, then Viceroy Count Rio Pardo for refusing to declare before offic receiving official news the adherence of Santa India to the liberal order installed in Portugal following the revolution of 24 August 1820. Yet, according to the story, Miguel Vicente Abreu, since March 20, 1821, that is six months before the movement, the news about the revolution in Portugal had reached the territory through British newspapers and private letters from Bombay and Calcutta reporting such news. That is, it was the access to, to what was happening in Portugal, uh, the access to what was happening in Portugal did arrive not directly from the metropolis, but from the press and access of news in British India. A situation that amounts to question the sources that by this time helped create public, local public opinion and the creation of a local public sphere, which was strong enough uh, and had impact enough to precipitate uh, uh, political uh, events. On the other hand, uh, the, birth, uh, the birth itself of uh, the Gazette de Goa disrupts uh, the idea of a, clo a colonial press created by uh, 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 a colonial uh, power to uh, to um, to discipline uh, the colonial subjects. In fact, the Gazette de Goa was born in the in the sequence of a revolution in Portugal that installed uh, the liberal order, and it was born not. Not, not by an, uh, 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 an authorized and recognized government in Portugal, uh, but by a revolutionary government in Goa. The first, uh, the, uh, which was led by, uh, both by metropolitan uh, station in Goa, and but counted with the support of the local uh, uh, native uh, Catholic uh, uh, elites, particularly the Brahmin elites. And the, the, uh, and the history of Gazeta Goa itself in, this, in the months that follow, it's quite significant. Its first, its first um, editor was um, Antonio José de Lima Leitão, uh, a doctor who had, uh, who had, uh, who was uh, to be later uh, elected uh, with uh, Bernard Pérez da Silva and Constance Roque da Costa. Uh, dep uh, uh, deputy to the Portuguese Parliament, and for this fact, he left the, uh, uh, the editorship of the of the newspaper. Uh, Lima Leitão had been involved uh, in, uh, in in in. in um, 
in the re uh, in the revolutionary idea uh, with the revolutionary ideas that since the beginning of the century impacted in Europe and he had even served the French army during the uh, uh, the Peninsula Wars. He was substituted by uh, Louis Pratt, who would uh, be assassinated three months later. Louis Pratt was uh, uh, a Brazilian uh, journalist who had been uh, exiled to Goa due to his involvement in a, 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 a revolutionary attempt in 1817 uh, in uh, Pernambuco. Both these uh, this, uh, uh, editors were quite involved with the native elites and had the support of such elites. On the contrary, the, uh, uh, the editor that uh, followed him, uh, followed them, was José Aniceto da Silva, a, a, a loser descendant that uh, completely turned around the, um, the profile of the newspaper uh, and that uh, later would uh, also write the newspaper associated with the government that um, that uh, that had um, by a revolution act deposited uh, Bernard Pérez de Silva and when he was nominated a gov uh, governor to go away. This means that we have to think about uh, how, how did uh, the history of the Gazeta de Goa, not as a flat history of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the Goan, uh, of the port, uh, of uh, uh, press, Created by the Portuguese government in a, in the in 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 the colonial territory, but as a complex history. And I and it is significant that in this that between its starting and its end, um, the 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 heading. Of the of the of this newspaper change completely. Curiously, both of them, bo uh, in both situations, the heading convoked Luis de Camões uh, Lusíadas. But while the first uh, the the first uh, verses con uh, referred to the arrival of, 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 of Portuguese in, in India, uh, encountering different uh, people and um, a different people, diverse, rich, and prosperous. The, the second heading, uh, the second heading uh, uh, introduced by Anisette de Silva uh, emphasized, on the contrary, the Portuguese, the link with the nation, Portuguese, uh, uh, the link of the territory with the Portuguese nation. That is, the Gazeta de Goa, the history of this, this uh, six, first six months of existence of Gazeta de Goa may need to be uh, 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 read in these uh, two uh, situations that marked Goan history, that of being part of a nation, of, of the Portuguese nation, 
ended up being a colonial, uh, a colonial uh, territory. That of being uh, a Indian space and that of being a subject of the Portuguese. And um, with this, I finish my intervention. Thank you, Dr. Sandra. I'm sure you have much to share, knowing your the, the kind of research that you yes. have. Sorry, I've I've uh, I've um, reduced a lot this, this intervention because uh, uh, if I was start, uh, starting to so I decided to focus on more on the theoretical part than on the analysis of press. Uh, of precise press. Uh, yes, thank you once again, Dr. Sandra. Along with her narrative, Dr. Sandra has posed various questions and I'm sure uh, they provide some food for thought for researchers on Goan history. We now start our third presentation by Professor Sushila Savan Mendes, who teaches history at Government College of Arts, Science and Commerce, Kepe. Recently, she has been bestowed with the best teacher award for excellence in higher education by the government of Goa 2020-21. Incidentally, I must share this, that Dr. Sushila is receiving this award on the 20, 20th of December, just three days from now. She's also the author of the book, Luis de Menezes Bragasa, Nationalism, Secularism and Free Thought in Portuguese Goa. She has presented research papers at state, national, and international conferences, many of which have found a place in, in books on Goan history. I call upon Professor Sushila Mendes to address the issue of mining the Goan Tribune as a mother load of Goan historiography. Thank you, Dr. Sharmila, respected fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. My topic today is mining the Goan Tribune as a mother load of Goan historiography. It is said that when the teacher is ready, the student appears. It was the angst of a migrated Goan community that was quite settled in Bombay to know about the happenings in their motherland, which was under a foreign colonial rule that brought together a young group of educated young men to form the Goa Liberation Council with Aloysius Suarez as its president. This council felt the need to have a mouthpiece. So it published a bulletin, which was the precursor of the Goan Tribune. The term mother load is the principal vein of an ore or mineral or a rich source of something. This periodical can be used as a tool of historiography in mapping out the political events as and when they took place, sometimes written by the participants themselves, the writers and the readers understand the struggle so thoroughly that the observer becomes a part of the observed. The writers blend and merge into the struggle and immerse their own identity to a group experience. This newspaper, from being an organ of the freedom struggle, in its early years, became a part and parcel of the struggle itself. This research paper studies the influence of these writings on the process of colonial transitions. Goan Tribune was about Goan history, Goan clubs, Goan seamen, and Goan villages. It had one section dedicated to women and children with Goan recipes and cuisine and with tips on rearing children. Every issue had a write-up of young, su successful, gone young men and women with a photograph as well as a column dedicated to eminent goals. It had wedding photographs of gone couples married outside Goa. The East African Chronicle was about the Goan diaspora. It surprisingly had a column with tips on horse races, as well as columns like humorous nemesis and articles signed under the pseudonyms like Aster, Silex, Nestor, Raf, and SV. 
The last straw by the camel was mainly based on political satires. It was because of this newspaper that people inside and outside Goa were aware of the political happenings taking place with regard to Goa. Example, the names of the satyagrahis who were imprisoned and released, announcements of meetings and political conventions, and also the names and photographs of the Goan delegations that the Minister of India, Pandit Nehru, are recorded. Serious and contemporary topics like the Konkani Marathi language issue and discussions on the Goa issue on the floor of the Indian Parliament were also discussed. Letters to the editor discuss popular sentiments of the Goan diaspora in the rest of the country and the world. The history of the freedom struggle can thus be rewritten using the writings and observations of these voices through the writer's frame of reference. It is limited to the freedom struggle of Goa. This study has made use of corroboratory approach in relation to the collection of data and their use. It uses the Goan Tribune as a base, but also uses oral history to identify from family narratives these rebellious voices. These writers use the printed word by evoking the valiant spirit of their ancestors to fight colonial rule. This study critically examines their writings and analyzes the role of their ideas and actions in the emergence of political consciousness in Goa. Oral interviews help to study from the respondents the history of their ancestors who were freedom fighters and journalists. The primary source for this re research is, however, the Goan Tribune of the, pre free of the period from 15, 1956 to 1962. Surprisingly, every edition was always on a Sunday. Unfortunately, all the copies of these papers are not available in any library except in one or two home archives. This is supplemented with secondary sources of the perspectives of different authors who have written on the history of Goa. Ideologically, this paper began as a mouthpiece of the Goa Liberation Council, but slowly embraced varied and diverse views by the time it was edited by Lambert Mashkarenas. There were views of other groups working towards a common goal, like the National Congress Goa, Azad Gomantak Dal, and the Goa Vimochan Sahayak Samiti, based in Pune. The need to bring the Goan question on the table for discussion and debate was the essence of the Goan Tribune. This fortnightly identified itself as the voice and expression of Goan people. Published in Bombay, it discussed the developments of Goa's freedom struggle in Goa, Bombay, and New Delhi, as well as other myriad topics like Goan cuisine, Goan women achievers, announcement of Goan deaths and marriages. The views of Pandit Nehru at press conferences and public rallies were transcribed verbatim. The regular section, which was given a lot of publishing space, was a letter from home which included the day-to-day -day happenings with reports of the Portuguese brutalities on unarmed satyagrahis and arrest of intellectuals and the long incarcerations in Portuguese jails. There are rare photographs of satyagrahas, of martyrs, and Pandit Nehru and Krishna Nenan addressing public meetings on the Goa issue, among others. This paper provides almost a day-to-day -day narrative of the last phase of Goa's freedom struggle and is a useful tool of historiography to rewrite the history of the last phase of Goa's freedom struggle for future researchers. It has columns, news from Goa. Once Goa was liberated on 19 December 61, the reason for this paper ceased to exist as most of the journalists involved now shifted base to Goa. The press played a key role in the, key role in the freedom struggle of India as also Goa. 
there were many periodicals. I have the beginning and the end year of each, which I will not say now, but the names, the Gomandak, Goan World, Amsogaon, Goa Mail, Ogoano, Goa, Colonia Goa, Diyaru de Goa, Eko de India, Era Nova, and Free Goa, and its associate paper in Konkani, Azad Coin. O Konkaini, Alush, O Liberal, O Amingo, Catholic Sawaskai in Konkani, Baura Dancho East, and Kurzjetso Avaz were other periodicals mostly published from Bombay. Newspapers in those days were not business enterprises, nor were the editors and journalists trained professionals. Newspapers were published as a national or public service. They were often financed as objects of philanthropy. To be a journalist was often to be a political worker and an agitator at considerable self-sacrifice. The major controversies of the day were conducted through the press. In this way, the Goan Tribune played an institutional role of opposition to the Portuguese government of Goa in Bombay. Almost every act of the government was subjected to sharp criticism, in many cases with vast learning backing it up. The national movement in general and the Goan freedom struggle in particular defended the freedom of the press whenever the government attacked it or tried to curtail it. In fact, the struggle of the freedom of the press became an integral part of the struggle for freedom. Most political parties who fought against the colonizers had no organization of their own for carrying on political work and its resolutions and proceedings had to be propagated through newspapers. Some of the more daring writers took recourse to irony, sarcasm, banter, mock seriousness, and burlesque. This was true in the case of Luis de Menezes Braganza, and also true in the case of others who needed to avoid the strict censorship of the colonial master, masters over the local press. The main editors of the Goan Tribune though I have the exact uh, newspapers and their dates, I will just narrate their names. Aloysius Suarez, L.J. D'Souza, Lambert Mascarenas, and lastly, Ben Antown. Most of the issues had 16 big pages on an average. It was published by Pegitan Lobo and printed by Jamshed Mystery at the Onlooker Press from Ballad Estate, Bombay. Nehru's Parliament on 4th May 55 was published in June 55 Goa Liberation, in the Goa Liberation Council Bulletin. This was published by J.N. Pinto, Joint Secretary, and printed by Pyarelal Shet of the Times of India printers. Nehru informed the Lok Sabha that the situation in Goa was grave and would become even graver if the Portuguese deport any of the Satyagrahis from Goa to Portugal. Thereafter, in the same bulletin, were the details of the press conference considered as one of the longest press conferences ever held by the Prime Minister Pandit Nehru on May 31st, 1956. Nehru said that the problem of Goa had come near a solution and that Goa would inevitably be merged in the Indian Union. He assured the people of Goa that as in the case of Pondicherry, Goa would be maintained as a separate democratic unit in confirmation with its individuality and historical background. Nehru reiterated that despite the non-cooperative attitude of Portugal, India would adhere to her basic policy of effecting a peaceful settlement. On the same front page was printed the interview of Dr. Paulo Cunha, Portuguese Minister of Foreign Affairs to the New York Times, wherein he spoke about the right and justice of Portugal, which are being violated by Nehru. 
Punia used the words a peaceful settlement and also said that the Catholics had full freedom in Goa. Portugal was of the view that though Goa was a separate unit, its history was not separate from Goa. The minister also warned the Satyagraha movement would face grave danger. The Goan Tribune created a generation of educated and empowered youth who started questioning the foreign colonial domination. The Satyagrahas of 54 and 55 had resulted in the massacre of non-violent men and women from different parts of India under the banner of the Goa Vimochan Sahayak Samiti. The issue of 11th August 1957 had an article, Lest We Forget, 15th August 1955, with photographs of the slain martyrs, Irve Guruji, Karnal Singh, and Madhukar Chaudhary. The last two rushed forward to save others and paid with their life. Here was a Maharashtran, a Punjabi, and a Bengali who had come to offer Satyagraha for the liberation of Goa. This newspaper also carried photographs of foreign journalists, for example, Homer Jackson, an American correspondent who was there and who said that there was no sign that the Satyagrahis were armed. Goa today should never forget the sacrifices of these young and brave souls who were less than 25 years. On that day, Satyagrahis entered from the different borders of Goa, from Terikol, Dodamar, Banda, Morji, Paushe, Palye, Castle Rock, where five were killed, Babulal Hotelwala of Rajgat, S. Raman and G. Jagmohan of Vijayawada, Nashu Kamle of Nagpur and Manush Guha of Calcutta. So it is very important to know that there were non-Goans who, who, who were shot for the sake of Goa. Pandit Nehru, of course, then put a ban on Satyagrahis entering Goa. A supplement was issued and distributed free of charge of Pandit Nehru's speech printed verbatim at the Goan rally at Siddharth Nagar, Bombay, held on June 4, 1956. He clarified that Goa will be maintained as a separate state and that every Goan would be free and co-equal citizens of India and added that Portugal needed to be removed from Goa as it was vital to India's national interest and security. Many Goan professionals wrote articles for this fortnightly. There were many from Asolna, Veli, and Kunkuli. There was advocate Luis Mendes, Narendra Kamat, and medical doctors like Rogasiolo Morais, Dr. Yoklit D'Souza, and academicians like Dr. Verissimo Putino and Ben Antaun. The Goan political convention delegation, which met Pandit Nehru on 25th December 1960, had a representative of important sections of Goan society, like Luis Mendes was the representative of the Goan Clubs Federation, Lambert Mascherenius represented the journalist fraternity, George Vaz, the trade unions, Dr. Yoklit D'Souza was active in garnering support for the Goa issue in East Africa. He worked for the cause of the African nationalists in their own struggle against the colonial masters. Rogasinio Moraes wrote on Our Village Kunkoli. No article on Kunkoli can be complete without mentioning the valor of the people in de defending their faith in 1583 and how the Kumunudad was confiscated and the people left poor. Mention is made of freedom, like Dr. John Carvalho, ex-president of the National Congress Goa, Professor George Morais, historian and author, Zuse Morais of the Azad Komantak Dal, Fulgenso Morais, and Vivian Almeida. It concludes with a call to summon the courage of the forefathers and close ranks to deal a death blow to Salazar. Luis Mendes contributed a number of articles. In fact, one article was on Goan seamen. 
which was titled Goan Seamen Suffer Great Hardship, which talked about the problems faced by seamen being overworked, underfed, and harassed with no provisions of overtime, leave, or recreation. Goa Nagar, a community project for Goan clubs in Bombay, speaks about the 18 Goan clubs or Coops in Bombay, wherein the idea is mooted of bringing together all these clubs to help Goans find their roots in India as well. The land was to be granted by the CM of Maharashtra, Muraji Desai. Another article, the concept of Daza, or the cons consent of the community elders, was the only law that was recognized by the Goans of the past, which could be implemented in this Envisaj community setup. In the village series, Punjab of Goa, Asolna, Veli, Kunkoli, Veroda, and Ambul Ambeli. He discussed how the people of these villages live with the spirit of confraternization, having 18 residential clubs in Bombay. The author says that it took him 25 years to discover the truth and power of Gandhianism. In this article, he mentions a conversation that he had with a priest about Satyagraha wherein the priest advocated it with the words, non-violence is the genius of our people. After the massacre of 54-55, Satyagrahas, Mendes suggests a novel means of protest to organize pilgrimages of Hindus and Christians in Romarias to the feast, to the feast, for the feast of St. Francis Xavier. The Portuguese, he said, would not dare to shoot or arrest such devotees. Another issue has a list of released political prisoners of the Goa Vimochan Sahayat Samiti, persons whom this author has had the privilege to interact in Pune, Nana Saheb Gore, Shirubau Limaye, and all the others, Madhu Limaye, Sindhu Deshpande. All the names of those who were released were put here and those who were imprisoned. The Goan Tribune has the names of Apa Kormalkar, Nagesh Desai, Ananta Pauskar, who were sentenced to rigorous imprisonment. The list is long. The atrocities in the Goan jails were written by Nana Sahib Gore, where he spoke about beatings with batons and living in cramped cells. The title was Freed Prisoners Tell Tales of Cruelty. Pandit Nehru addressed another Goan rally on 13 June 1958. Nehru Ismo is a full page write-up on the leader's political philosophy. The article written by Lambert Mashkarelis shows the angst at the uncooperative behavior of the Prime Minister Nehru. He is said to have played into the hands of Salazar and is mocked upon as Nehru the patient, Nehru the peaceful. The author feels Salazar's heroism should be dubbed Nehruism. Advocate Narendra Kamath wrote in articles, Goan have become sterile. They have nothing more than a, they are nothing more than a pack of mediocrities to face the challenges of Salazar. He wrote another article with the same spirit of defiance, titled, Bombay Goans are affect, affected by the paralysis of the soul. He uses the words, the community is as dead as the dodo. Besides this, of course, Dr. Yoklit D'Souza wrote a historical article about the confiscation of Kunkoli, a historical survey. Apart from all this, Ben Antaung joined the newspaper in mid-61, writing on the sports page. But thereafter, he wrote, after liberation, the article, A Bright Future for Goans After Goa. I'd like to conclude by talking about the writings of these rebellious voices of the people of Goa, especially those of Asolna Veli and Kunkoli, which evoked a martial spirit of their ancestors and justified the need for the people of these villages 
to provide the lead in the struggle against Portuguese colonialism. A number of youth who had been influenced by the writings of Luis de Menezes Braganza questioned the role of organized religion and also the partnership of the church and the state in Portuguese Goa. The role of the Roman church was questioned on many an occasions. Luis Mendes and Domingos Aguiar, in fact, refused to get married in a Catholic church and preferred to get married in Gandhi's ashram. The Gandhian principles of violence as weapons of driving out a mighty colonial power like the British in the rest of the country had sown faith in these principles among the educated youth who then wrote about the efficacy of these methods if applied to Portuguese Goa. Most of the writers were activists. Luis Mendes founded the Maritime Association and the Goa Toddy Tappers Association. Dr. Yoklit was active as vice president of the East African Goan League. Most writers use pseudonyms. The reason was that the authorities in their frustration in not finding the person used fear tactics by raising the village houses and used violence on the family members. The whole movement of young people voicing their rebellion in the press had a pan-India effect. In fact, the government tried its best in these papers that these papers do not reach Goa. The contribution of the Goan Tribune has been largely unnoticed and ignored both by historians and history. Perhaps this is because of the unavailability of the public libraries. However, it fired the nationalist spirit that was the need of the time and provided intellectuals for discussion and debate of the important issues of that point of time that faced Goa's future. Thank you. Professor Sushila's presentation provides evidence that the Goan Tribune is indeed a mother load of Goan historiography. It can be explored further to understand different facets of Goan history, both political and cultural. The last presenter for today's uh, webinar is Dr. Cielo Griselda Pestino, who teaches English at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She is a member of the project Thinking Goa, a singular archive in the Portuguese, 2015-2020, funded by Sao Paulo Research Foundation. She is a co-editor with Paul Mel e. Castro of A House of Many Mentions, Goan Literature in Portuguese, an anthology of Goan original essays, short stories, and poems, published in 2017, and again with Paul Meli Castro, Elder Garmish, and Robert Newman of another work, Guns on the Move, a special issue in a journal of Portuguese diaspora studies, published in 2018. Additionally, Dr. Cielo has several other publications on Indian literature. Our speaker will now address on the theme, O Eraldo to Eral, the complex linguistic matrix of a Goan daily. Cannot. Sushila, can you see my slides? I'm going to put it back. We, we are unable, uh, Dr. Cielo. Can you see it now? Not yet. Okay, now I think we can. Yeah, we can see now. Yes, is it okay? Like this? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, first of all, I would like the organizers of this event, Sharmila, Sushila, Frederick, also, the other fellow panelists, Rosa Maria, Sandra, Sujil again, and all the people who are watching us today. This paper that I am presenting, From Heraldo to Herald, the Complex Linguistic Matrix of the Goan Daily, 
was written, uh, to, I wrote together with Professor Elder Garments from uh, Universidad de San Paulo. And it says like this, founded by Antonio Mesias Gomez, Geraldo Herald is considered one of the longest running newspapers in the Portuguese language outside Portugal and Brazil. In 1983, 12 years after the integration of Goa into India, the journal started being published in English as Herald. Its title in the front page in two colors is a combination of the words Weraldo in Portuguese and Herald in English. This play on words points to the plurilingualism that characterizes India in general and Goa in particular. Kanaga Rajan Ashtra, 2013, established a difference between multilingualism and plurilingualism. And they say, while multilingualism treats the different languages as having their separate systems, enjoying autonomy, plurilingualism perceives these languages as meshing with each other to form hybrid grammatical and communicative practices. Though the introduction of the Portuguese language in Goa altered the language panorama of the region, and the one language system was enshrined when supremacy was given to the Portuguese language over the other languages, it became enmeshed with the local languages. Hence, depending on the political and cultural situation of the day, Goan speakers of Portuguese and Konkani, though sometimes belonging to different social ranks, supported each other, thus problematizing the expected opposition position, or the expected opposing position between European national languages and Eastern vernacular languages, according to Orsini 2018. To add to the complexity of this linguistic panorama, though during the Portuguese regime, Portuguese was the official language of Goa and even became the mother tongue of some members of the Catholic gentry, many members of this community preferred to become proficient also in English rather than Portuguese because it offered them the chance to work both in British India and in the British colonies in Africa due to the shortage of work in Goa. Therefore, once the Portuguese regime came to an end, the Portuguese language lost its st status as official language in the colony and English became its main vehicular language as it was in the rest of India. As Kanagara Janashtra 2013 explained, in India, there is not only a divide between European and local languages, but also between dominant regional languages and less privileged ones. In the case of Goa, it is exemplified in the strife between Konkani and Marathi and Konkani in the Romi and Ivanagari scripts. As is well known, Konkani rather than Marathi became the official language of Goa in, in 1987, when it was recognized as one of the 22 scheduled languages mentioned in the Indian constitution. It was not by chance then that already in 1982, a section of the Oraldo starts being published in Konkani as a sign of the changes in linguistic and matters taking place in Goa. If it is true that there is some overlapping between the languages spoken in Goa and certain ideological positions, as for example, the production in Portuguese might be said to be related to the former Goan colonial elites, while the production in English might be related to a rejection of the Portuguese language and the desire to become more connected to the rest of India, inside the universe of every language, there is an unmistakable mix of this ideological position as the relationship between these European languages and the Indian languages show. Hence, the relationship between language and politics in Goa is quite complex. It is precisely the passage from one European language to the other in the Oeraldo Herald, as well as their relationship with Konkani, that we intend to address in this paper in terms of one symbolical moment, the year 1983, when Oeraldo Herald went through a process of change and English switched places with Portuguese as it became the language of the front page, while Portuguese was limited to the back pages of the paper. In the front page of Oeraldo of July 23, 1983, there is a one tab for reporters for an English daily based in Goa. Graduates with a flair for writing should present themselves for an interview at the Oeraldo offices opposite the municipal garden in Panjim. And I think that Frederick Noronha was one of those graduates. Though Oeraldo is not mentioned in the ad, this is obviously the beginning of the new avatar of this centennial daily. 
While this change of language gave to the journal a wider circulation beyond the Portuguese speaking community, it was lamented by many who saw the Portuguese language in Goa jeopardized. In the edition of Heraldo of January 29, 1983, 10 months before the journal began to be published in English, the editorial, O Destino da Lingua Portuguesa in Goa, the future of the Portuguese language in Goa, deals precisely with this issue. If during the last years of the Portuguese government, the situation of the Portuguese language had been critical, it became aggravated once Goa became part of India. In 1961, the only journal still published in Portuguese was Eweraldo. The editor adds, however, that the three new journals started being published in Portuguese after this period, Aluta, O Globo, and Arpa Goesa. While Aluta and Arpa Goesa were short-lived, O Globo finally changed from Portuguese to English. The explanation for this is that already during the last years of the Portuguese government, for every Lyceum, there were six high schools, which meant a fast spread of the English language in Goa. In March 1980, Graciete Batalha, a Portuguese teacher resident in Macau, visited Goa to conduct research on the situation of the Portuguese language in that former Portuguese colony. Batalha published an article in Oeraldo in which she affirms that, and I quote, Portuguese had become, had turned into a language of the past, the language of the ancestor. This was published in Oeraldo, March 19, 19, 1983, page two. Not only, not only did uh, some sectors of the Goan population feel that the Portuguese language was being jeopardized by the advancement of English, but also speakers of Konkani and Marathi felt the same. In the editorial, Prosperidade do Inglês por conta do Konkani Maratha, the thriving of English at the expense of Konkani and Marathi, published in the issue of Oeraldo, July 23, 1983, the editorialist brings up the request of a member of the Legislative Assembly to the Minister of Education to take urgent corrective measures as schools in which the means of instructions were Konkani or Marathi were closing down because they were uh, losing their students to the schools in which the instruction was in English. If Weraldo resisted to the end and was the last journal to be published in Portuguese in India, it was the second journal to yield to English in Goa, the first being the Napkin Times and the third, the Gomantak. Uh, uh, Goman this is an information from Frederick Noronian, 2008. Weraldo started being published in English when it was bought by A.C. Fernandez, who appointed as editor Rajan Narayan from Mumbai in October 1983. Narayan became an emblematic and controversial figure of this new era of journalism in Goa, according to Faleiro, 2008. He was editor of the Herald until 2003. Frederick Noronha states that he both rewrote the rules of journalism in Goa and opened the path for a new generation of journalists. He was a central figure during the language issue, mediating the relationship between readers and activists to secure a wider readership for the new Herald. When the Herald was launched in 1983, that is to say, Oeraldo in English, it became a contact zone for the heterogeneous reading public in Goa, which belonged to the different language communities, Konkani, Marathi, or Portuguese, as it brought them all together in spite of their differences due to the vehicular role of the English language. For the reasons stated above, not all local languages, as would be the case of Konkani, had a massive access to the media. Konkani was associated with the less learned sector of the population, which many times only mastered the rudiments of the written form of the language. This is why the Portuguese speaking community in Goa backed up the creation of journals in Konkani, since like them, they belong to the Goan Christian community. And it was a way of giving force to their own community in a moment when Goa was part of India and their beliefs and way of life might be in danger. Of course, there were a number of journals in Konkani, as according to Mishra 2004, some of, which, uh, some of them were uh, written in Devanagari, others in Romi, and others in Romi and Devanagari, like Novengoa. And also, according to an article published in Oeraldo, Independence Day Special Supplement of August 15, 1983, there were, of course, a number of journals also in Marathi, some of which also had a section in Portuguese.
As Matsukawa 2001 remarks, in a country like India, in which there is a hierarchy among languages, not all languages reach the print media, or if they do, they do not necessarily have the same circulation among readers. This is directly related to two issues, whether the language has a written register and the level of literacy of the speakers. Regarding Konkani, uh, regarding Konkani, yes, this was one of the main concerns of Weraldo from the first decades of the 20th century. Already in 1916, the newspaper not only championed the cause of primary and secondary education in Goa in order to raise the education level of the masses, but also, as suggested in 1916 by Luis de Menezes Braganza, it, uh, uh, he was in favor of education being carried out not only in Portuguese, but also in Konkani, Goa's mother tongue. And I quote, we are here over a century involved upon fighting illiteracy by means of a language, Portuguese, ignored by the people which they do not need to know to make their living and expelling from primary school in a nationalistic desire, the mother tongue, which is Konkani. The idea was that children should learn to read and write in their mother tongue and that such teaching should be part of the syllabus of the normal school, concomitantly with Portuguese. At another level, what Menese Fraganza was seeking was that Konkani should become a relevant part of Goa's public sphere, which during colonial times was mainly represented by the printing media in the Portuguese language. Nonetheless, at the end of the Portuguese regime, as English became one of the prominent languages of the public sphere, the Konkani speaking community also made use of this media, apart from the existing journals in the Konkani language, in order to publicize their opinions and ideas, and the Oeraldo was foremost in this endeavor. Before becoming Herald, Oeraldo created a section called English section, in which some columns were devoted to publishing local news from the different Goan cities and villages, as well as ads in English. Also in this section were published articles on Goan culture and the Konkani language, evidently to defend local cultural roots. In the issue of January the 4th, 1983, can be seen advertised the All Goa Konkani Writers Conference, in which one of Goa's most outstanding writers, Lakshman House, are the site, who wrote in Marathi, in, Por in Konkani, and in Portuguese, would receive the Sahitya Academy Award, thus showing the interest of the editors of Oeraldo to give visibility to literature in local languages. This same piece of news is taken up again and developed in the issue of February 18, 1983, in which it is said that in the seventh Indian Con Pan-Indian Convention of Writers in Konkani would be demanded that Konkani become the main language of the Union Territory and that it should be included in the eighth schedule of the national constitution. The delegates were from Maharashtra, Karnataka, Kerala, and Goa. Then in the English section of Weraldo, February 19, uh, 1983, this piece of news is resumed when it is said that writers, editors, and publishers would meet in order to accelerate the development of Konkani language and progress of Konkani literature. Again, on February 22, 1983, this piece of news gets to the front page of the journal uh, uh, in Portuguese as the writers in Konkani threatened with a demonstration, violent if necessary, in order to force the Indian central government to include Konkani in the eighth schedule. They also demanded from the government that Konkani should be uh, in declared the official language of the Union territory. Again, in the issue of Oeraldo, February 25th, 1983, there is a very interesting article. The article, Voz de Goa, Goa's Voice, questions the launch of a new journal in, Port in the Portuguese language. The main critique of the author, Vasco Alvarez, had to do with the fact that a journal that pretended to be the voice of the Goan people should be published in Konkani rather than in Portuguese. In particular, because Konkani was the mother tongue of the editors of the new journal, and all of them defended this language. With a certain irony, he explains the misconception of the editors when he states that the journal was addressed to the landowners and therefore was far from being progressive or defending the rights of the people. 
the desire to affirm the Konkani language is again expressed in different issues of the Weraldo in the main section of the newspaper in the Portuguese language through a series of articles on Goan folklore, Canções Folcloricas Boesas. This appeared in different issues of the Weraldo, February 18th, February 22nd, and February 24th of 1983. In these articles, it is stated that the tradition of the people living their songs and dances, which are small historical documents. Rodriguez not only affirms that Goans have songs for all occasions, sad and happy ones, both religious and secular, but he also gives a learned and thorough explanation of the origin and use of these songs in Romy Concane. Little by little, the journal continued being bilingual, and, the name of it, and, and while the name of the journal was still in Portuguese, English took the place of Portuguese, while Portuguese was relegated to the inside of the journal. A short article published in the front page of Weraldo of August 26, 1983, in which the Indian government demanded that the statue of Camões be removed from Panjim was symbolical of this change. And to conclude, Though the relationship between European and vernacular languages has always been asymmetrical in terms of discursive and political power, in the case of Goa, in the context of the language issue, a daily like the Oeraldo Herald went beyond this paradigm as it became a contact zone among languages, first when published in Portuguese and then in English, as it backed up a local language, Konkani, in order to grant it a public sphere much larger in scope. While Marathi also found a similar public forum in the uh, English journals like the Napkin Times or the Goman Tax. In both cases, these dailies in a European national language but of different ideologies align with local languages, either Konkani or Marathi, on the war path with each other in order to foster the traditions of their own communities. The dailies such thus became a site in which people who identified with different languages supported each other, although they belonged to different walks of life. This singular dynamics of Goa as a particular plurilingual society is one of the lateral outcomes of the relationship between colonialist and local languages in a former colony that does not necessarily fit into the model center and periphery generally associated with the relationship between Western and Eastern languages. Though for political, cultural, or religious reasons, rather than being isolated units in competition, in the transition of Goa from a colony to a union territory and then to a state, colonialist and vernacular languages complemented each other. One of the forums in which the singular situation became most clearly recorded in Goa was journalism, in particular, the pages of the daily Weraldo Herald, as can be seen in these languages of publication. On September 6, 2020, as you can see here in the slide in the Oji Macau, the Herald started to publish a weekly chronicle in Portuguese, still in the wake of the newspaper's 120th anniversary, which reveals that the linguistic issue in Goa remains quite dynamic. This attitude seems to signal the overcoming, at least in part, of the colonial trauma, finding in the Portuguese language a constitutive element of Goan history materialized in the archives and libraries that keep alive the memory of that historical period. This fact shows how complex the relationship between language and society is, since on the one hand, it is connected with issues related to the pragmatic use of the language, and on the other, it goes far beyond it as it relates with identity and political issues. Hence the importance of standing and understanding it as plurilingualism in the Goan press is certainly a great challenge. And Oedaldo Hiddle, one of the most exciting and emblematic examples of this phenomenon. This is my bibliography of the article. Yes. And thank you very much to all of you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cielo. The phase of transition of the language is aptly addressed by Dr. Cielo. And the slide on the future of the Portuguese language is something that has captured my attention. Now with this, we come to the end of these four beautiful presentations. Although we are a little beyond our schedule, we still can make time for some questions. 
unfortunately as i got locked out of the meet i lost some of these questions could i request dr frederick or professor sushila to read the first few questions i can no longer see in my chat box because i got locked out for a while it's all right sharmila frederick will ask professor or Uh, okay, can I can I reply? First of all, um, my apologies, but I really have to leave because I have another commitment with as, which has been scheduled on go as well as tomorrow. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not an expert on the press, and I don't think that I can talk about the press. It's it's huge, and and it's not my field of expertise. Uh, the, 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 the press, the colonial press that I've been focused on is dominantly the, 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 newspa the newspapers and the periodicals published um, between 1954 and 1959 when the, these nationalist women were given um, uh, amnestia. I'll just say it in English, sorry, I'm a little bit confused. Anyhow, um, in the PowerPoint that I was uh, in, that I had intended to show, but I, I tried to keep within my 20 minutes. Uh, there is a last slide of a uh, Go Tribune uh, 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 issue that mentioned women nationalists in, 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 in Goa. In fact, uh, the, the, to reply directly to Sharmila, there is, there, there, there is a representation of the subaltern even though that representation is not, of course, very precise or detailed, and it's dominantly about men. But there are, women are mentioned, even though uh, the women who are mentioned are dominantly Catholic. But there are also a few non-Catholic women, like Hindu women. Uh, anyhow, um, of course, the, we cannot identify uh, a, a, a detailed stratification of the subaltern, of what the subaltern, but when we think of Portuguese colonialism and its, and of, the, of course, the, the liberation movement in Goa, uh, those were engaged in journal terms, those were engaged in the nationalist movement to a subaltern can be classified, <coughs> sorry, I have a terrible allergy, as subaltern. But, uh, well, my answer is um, that, yes, in the sense that, in a way or another, they were subaltern vis-a-vis -vis the Portuguese regime, even though th those that had to move um, to other parts of India. <coughs> but as I also mentioned in my presentation, women are not dominant or dominantly uh, described in the, in the press that I know, of course, as I said, and out of clarification, the press is, cru is crucial to complement my research, but I'm not an expert, and they have dominantly focused on this um, period of time between 1955 and uh, 1959, yes. Well, in 1961 afterwards. The problem is the, the last one mentions um, women, a group of women nationalists in, 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 um, in Goa, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And I would like to thank my colleagues for their amazing and thoughtful uh, presentations. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I won't be able to follow the debate, but um, maybe it's, it will be recorded and then I can attended. Thank you so much. And thank you, most of all, to the organizers. Bye. Bye. Can we ask, Frederick, can you ask Sandra, please?
Okay, Frederick. In the meanwhile, I think I can uh, I can read a question here. Uh, there's a question from Edith Nell for the who say who had initially had she had posed a question to Professor Sushila and it's repeated. She could answer or uh, Dr. Sandra also could write either of them. My question could be addressed. She says to Sandra as well as uh, Sushila. I understand that Sushila is discussing one tribune, but I would like to know uh, from Sandra if. Goa today is equally important for the study of uh, Goan history and culture. I think that's what she meant, because I don't have the original chat here. Sandra, would you like to answer? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, I can I can try to answer although I'm uh, I'm not familiar uh, I've never studied Goa today I remember that go what I can give as a testimony is that all my life while my father was alive uh, Goa today would be present at home either in india or later when we came to portugal so many times i've uh, i've uh, also read uh, 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 the issues and uh, yes i think that go today uh, became uh, an important tribune for uh, for, for for many Goans to think about uh, both cultural and uh, uh, political um, issues in the not only in Goa but also uh, important debates that were going on in India and um, from that point of view I, 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 I do remember my father frequently can be uh, commenting on such such debates uh but sorry uh i can't this is just a personal um reflection it's not a scholar's reflection thank you sandra yeah you know if i uh, please allow me to say something on uh, goa today because incidentally uh in the institution that I work, we had a large number of copies uh, of Goa today, right from, I remember, 1961 to uh, 80 and even uh, 90s and 20s. And we are still there in the library. And I find that the copies are very useful for the study of uh, Goan history. Some of the contributors, Professor Fyodonio Souza has written a number of articles on, uh, uh, on various aspects of Goan history. Information on education has been, uh, you find a lot of information by uh, Varde who has worked on uh, education and subsequently he brought out a book on education. But much before that, I find a lot of articles of Goan historians and researchers in Goa today as well. If you go back right to uh, some of the earliest publications, I think it's a very good, it, I'm not in a position to compare Goa today and the Goan Tribune because I haven't really explored Goan Tribune. But Goa today, I think I can vouch that it is a very uh, important source of information for scholars of Goan history. Thank you. I would, I would uh, sorry, like just to add, uh, just to add, I think that we we can think uh, uh, Goan today as uh, an intellectual tribune. Uh, a very important intellectual tribune in in those days in in during the, the post-colonial decades in Goa. Would you agree, uh, Sharmila? Yes, definitely, definitely. Hmm. Yes, can I add, Sharmila? Yeah, sure. Yes, you know the Goan uh, Goa today has been uh, very important for its different uh, you know different facets of Goan culture and history. For example. Central Library, all the writings on Goan villages, which appeared on Goa today, have been compiled together by Maria Paiva. And uh, if anybody wants any information on villages, in brief, it is there. Then I remember uh, different aspects. For example, what is Goan identity? Uh, there are writings of about 40, 50 individuals in one Goa today. So. 
uh, WAR today has done a pioneering uh, effort in presenting before uh, the Goan diaspora as well as the Goans with regard to Goan history, Goan cultural history, as well as uh, Goa's freedom struggle. And for this, we ought to owe our tribute to Lambert Mashkarenis, who, uh, who, who did this with a lot of passion and thereafter the other editor, Vinayak. So I agree with Edit that uh, uh, both Goan Tribune and Goa Today have ample scope for future researchers in, uh, in writing on Goan historiography. I may, I may also reply to Frederick Norona's question uh, with, with regard to Pandit Nehru's address to me with regard to Pandit Nehru uh, subsidizing uh, newspapers or the press. You know, uh, as Goan Tribune is concerned, it is written there that uh, young girls and boys would uh, sell it outside Goan churches and they would collect monies in boxes from the parishioners. Uh, also, whenever Pandit Nehru had rallies at Chopati, etc., the names of the people who collected money in those boxes are given. So there is no historical evidence to say that Pandit Nehru uh, supported any of the Goan newspapers, Fred, if you say that he supported the East African chronicles uh, like uh, Pio Gamas, etc. There's no evidence. In fact, these papers criticized Pandit Nehru for his long delay in sending the army and there's absolutely no evidence that he supported them. You must read Bipin Chandra's book on uh, India's freedom struggle uh, and he writes in detail about how the press was a kind of a self-sacrificing industry. Sandra's uh, question to me with regard to uh, how the Goan Tribune is not available in libraries except in some home archives. You know, Sandra, we don't have in Goa something like the Emorateka, like you have in Lisbon, which, which does a lot, lot of work with regard to the preservation of newspapers. Uh, this is not there, sadly, in Goa. Uh, I wish it was there. And secondly, Goan Tribune newspapers were run by political activists. They were run by freedom fighters. They were not, it was not run by professionals. And therefore, it is only a few freedom fighters who wrote for these papers, who passionately collected them, who preserved them, but there was no institutionalized, um, uh, institutionalized support to collect all the Goa tribunes together. So I have a few copies because Many of my family were freedom fighters. So uh, uh, Lambert Mashkarenis has donated his copies to the Central Library. So uh, that, in fact, has been done a couple of years ago. So that is a lot of uh, good, good work done by uh, the Lambert, uh, about by the Mashkarenis family for future historiography and for future historians. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sushila. This was, uh, I was a little provocative uh, regarding that because um, I think that there's a, a lot of work to be done in regard uh, 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 of effort, especially in Goa, to be, uh, to be done regarding the collecting all these materials. And at least uh, if families don't want to give up the materials, at least try to digitalize. Uh, of course, this is a role that maybe Central Library to, could take or uh, um, the Goa University, at least digitalize the, the materials and make them accessible to, to researchers. Because uh, as we know, <clears throat> as time passes, families tend not to uh, tend to give less and less importance to such materials and the risk of them being lost, uh, it's huge. 
um, and also m many times they are not kept in the best conditions, uh, as we all know. And also, this this issue has a lot to do with with the problem of preserving um, anti-colonial resistant materials. Uh, uh, in in public uh, archives and libraries, because in colonial times they were uh, mostly banned, and in post-colonial times it became difficult to reunite this this uh, uh, this material. So a lot of effort must be done in in that in that field, so that we have a more plural access to the history of, uh, of colonial spaces. Sharmila, any questions to Dr. Cielo? I, I, I can't see any questions. Okay. Yes, there are two questions, one by Sandra and one by Edith, that I can answer if you want. Please go ahead. Okay, so the first question that Sandra asked, and I think is related to the question that Idichi also asked me about post colonial states uh, taking up uh, European languages. I think that languages belong to those persons who speak the languages. So once the community speaks the language, the community, the language belongs to the community. This is the case of English, and this I think should be the case of Portuguese. So what is interesting in my opinion, and this is what should be done, I don't know how easy or difficult it is, is that these, uh, these European languages have become part of the local identity. They are in the DNA of the culture. So why not having a journal in Portuguese? So why not having a section of Herald, Heraldo in Portuguese? I think it should be done because this is also a way of preserving the wonderful archives in uh, of literature, uh, literary texts in the Portuguese language that otherwise would be completely lost. So I think, yes, why not? I think it's good what uh, Herald is doing of bringing back uh, these articles in Portuguese and the same as English. English today is one of the Indian languages and many Indians consider it a basha, that is to say a local language. Why not Portuguese? I think it should be exactly the same case. And I think that languages can live together. And this is what makes it the most interesting. And what I find fascinating in the case of Geraldo is all this play or this among languages. So how they would move from one language to the other in order to support another language uh, with sections in Konkani or with articles in Portuguese or in English, but about the Konkani language or about the Konkani uh, roots or the Konkani literature. So. These are plurilingual cultures, and I wish we were also plurilingual cultures, and our local languages were also preserved. But once a foreign language is spoken in a community, the language belongs to them. And I think that Portuguese is part of Goa, and Goan should preserve the language. This is, a, this is what I think. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. I think we are done with our questions. So Sheila, do you see any more questions in the chat? I don't see any more. I think we are done. Okay, yes. Uh, we now come to the conclusion of the first day of this virtual meet. And with this, I would like to thank profusely our distinguished speakers and participants who have spared their time to be present here today. It's good night from Goa and I'm sure a pleasant morning in Brazil and, and uh, uh, Portugal as well. So thank you very much. And we meet again tomorrow, six o'clock Indian Standard Time, 9.30 Brazil time and 12.30 uh, 12 uh, Portugal time. Thank you so much. Bye, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yes, see you all tomorrow. tomorrow.